Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, our text for today. Before I uh, begin on the reading the scripture, I want to say a, a, just a word that I've noticed. First of all, I've been on vacation for a couple of weeks. Thank you. What a wonderful opportunity to go and experience a lot of things. We had some Scottish family with us, 15 of them, and uh, it was wonderful to have them. They're great people and just had a great time. But I did a lot of reflecting. You'll hear more about that in the sermon today. Uh, but before I begin, I was talking with people this morning uh, at the first service and before the first service, and I, I suspect people are frustrated and angry today. Let me ask if we could do this today. Let's drop politics for a brief moment, can we? Because people are angry, very angry. Whether you're Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, doesn't matter. People are very angry. And in those two weeks that I spent on vacation, I got sucked into social media. And I got angry because I have very strong opinions about politics too. But then I had to come to the realization again, Jesus is still on the throne. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, and all that is in between. He is everything, and, 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 and we can't lose sight of that. Everything's okay. Can you take a deep breath with me this morning? And let's spend the next moments together leading up to communion, remembering that Jesus is on the throne. And we don't need to be so angry and frustrated and the world's not going to end by human means. It's, it's, it's going to go on, and Jesus will come again, and he will reign forever and ever as he is reigning right now this morning. And we come before communion. That's the focal point. We come to remember what he's done, that he, his body was broken on the cross. His blood was poured out so that we would be forgiven and that we would be one, that we would not think all the same way, that's for sure, but we would be one. And I pray that as we have communion this morning, we will be in communion, where we get the word community from. We may have different thoughts about everything. But let's drop the frustrations. And let's remember that the kingdom of God is here now and is coming in all of its fullness. And that's our eternal home. Would you bow with me in prayer? Almighty God, we thank you that you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, that you hold the universe in your hands. We pray that as we come to church today and just as we've worshiped in singing and, and in prayer, Lord, that we would come together around the message, your word, as we read the scripture, and around the communion table and remember that you love us so much, more than we can ever begin to imagine, that we are your children and that we are to love one another. We are to love this world. Holy Spirit, we ask that you fall on us new and fresh today. Take away all the concerns that we have, not just of the world and the frustrations and, and the fears, but the ones that hit very close to home in our hearts, the ways in which we wonder how we'll get through another moment or another day. Lord, you know those things. And Jesus, in your sermon, you taught us in the Sermon on the Mount that we could trust in you, that you would take care of the birds of the air, the lilies of the field. How much more value are we? So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you fall upon us and melt away all those things and remind us of the greatness and glory and majesty of our Father who is in heaven. May we worship your Son, Jesus, as we ask this in his name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 16 is often called the faith chapter uh, because it talks about, it defines faith and it defines people of faith and uh, as we look through the scripture today, we'll learn more about how these people, heroes of faith, how they live their lives and how we can live our lives as well. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen is, was not made out of things that are visible. By faith. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, he, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, 
Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and, was, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he co condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has its foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand in the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and have acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the past two weeks, uh, my brother sent to me, my brother Tom in Wisconsin, sent to me uh, pictures that he had found. Some of them I had never seen before. Others I had forgotten they existed. Uh, pictures of my ancestors from long ago. I don't know where he found these files, but he sent them to me. Then he sent me pictures of my parents and their marriage and, and their wedding and then, you know, children in the family. They sent me, he sent me pictures of myself when I was a little boy in the 1960s and the 70s. And it was interesting in the past two weeks going through them and reflecting on my life and how I'm a part of a larger family together. And yet I saw some photographs that brought up some feelings and thoughts about my life and what God has done in my life. It's, it's easy, I think, to look back on your life and see where God has been with you than it is to see God in the current moment, isn't it? You can always look back and say, oh, there you were, God. That's what you did. That's how it all came to pass. One of a, couple, a few pictures, one of the files was called uh, Jamaica, in which my father in the early 70s went to serve as a chaplain on a ship called Hope helping other people everywhere. It was a hospital ship based in Montego Bay. And they brought people from the island who were in need. They were sick and they were dying. They had cancer or other diseases. And uh, my father was there for a whole summer. He was a pastor in western New York, but he went there for a whole summer. And one month, my mother and us children went and, and stayed there, uh, there in Jamaica. And uh, we got to tour the ship called Hope. I remember as a little boy walking around and seeing children in need dying. And the impression that it put on my mind of, of, wow, life comes and it goes. And these poor children, though I was one myself, you know, child. I, I remember uh, there are two pictures in particular I want to show that came from the file because there are two women. My father was, uh, one day went out to a leprosy hospital on the backside of the island, Jamaica, where the tourists didn't go where people deny there was a leprosy hospital, but there it was. And I remember seeing these women, and the one on my left to your right is a woman that has leprosy, and there, I, there are a lot more pictures. I just selected that as one of them because I remember her. And the one on my right is a woman who had been uh, racked with syphilis. She had gone out of her mind. She was throwing ashes on her face and, uh, or dirt on her face. And, uh, you know, as a little boy, that puts an indelible impression on you. As I was looking through these pictures this last couple of weeks, the feelings came up in me, and I remembered the trip to Jamaica, and when I left Jamaica, I wanted to help people. That's all I wanted to do in life. I wanted to alleviate the suffering of this world. I just wanted to help one person in my life, and if I helped one, it would be enough. 
That's what is at the core of my being after seeing those images. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to alleviate the suffering of the world and be a physical representation of God's love to other people in every way. I know why the Holy Spirit sent those pictures through my brother. Because I needed to be invigorated in my faith again. I needed to remember the moment when God called me to do something. Now, since my father is the pastor, was the pastor, I wasn't going to go and follow his footsteps. I was going to be the physician. I was going to go and become the medical doctor who would be like the Albert Schweitzer. I read a book as, uh, of Albert Schweitzer when I was a little boy and thought, oh, he left. I knew nothing about his theology. All I knew is he left what he had and went to people and helped them. And I wanted to do that too. But God had other plans. And I'm a minister and a pastor. But, but you know, it's so easy in our faith to lose focus, isn't it? To go in and do the, the things that we think are ministry and forget why God called us to that moment. Do you remember when God called you to ministry? Do you remember that feeling when you knew that God said, hey, here's who you are. This is your purpose. Now go do it. Maybe you haven't received that. Maybe this morning you're going to receive that call to ministry. Whatever it is, remember that moment because it's for that reason that God put you there. And I had to look at my life. Now, I didn't lose sight of the fact of helping other people, but I lost the feeling of that first call. I look around in this world, and this is why I started the message by talking about politics. And I realized in those two weeks of vacation, I got sucked into social media and I, I got angry just like everybody else is angry. And I, I started being a part of the machinery of the world of hatred and anger. And I said, wait a minute, this is wrong. We're called to be people of love and peace. And though we may fight for our thoughts and ideas at the, in it all, we must worship Jesus, and it should be for his sake. And I can tell you this, I believe this with my heart, God calls us to alleviate the suffering of the world. And if that's not a part of our Christianity, we got nothing. Two of my favorite passages came up from the Bible that I remember hearing as a little boy, knowing that we've been saved by grace alone. There's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. God gives it to us. Jesus died on the cross for our sins so we could live for him in grace and in peace and in love. But James tells us, now remember, it's not only grace, it's faith without works is dead. You received it. What are you doing with it? And secondly, Scripture in James 1, religion that, a, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself polluted by the world. It's about as simple as it can be for our faith, isn't it? We're to be here to take care of one another and to live the kingdom and to live in holiness and righteousness and not go the ways of the world into degradation. That's the world. We're, we're to call people into the kingdom and, and, and remind them that we're here to love the world. It'll be no surprise to you that I often get discouraged of Christianity today. Sometimes it becomes a circus. I'm firmly convinced that the great, quote, religious heroes of our time might face shame in the eternal world to come because they weren't servants like we're all called to be. On the other hand, I'm firmly convinced that the people we know nothing about who live this life helping others for the sake of Jesus Christ will have their names lifted high in the world to come because they were faithful and they were servants. And they determined to love God even to death, not compromising their faith. And they alleviated the suffering of the world. You see, that's true faith to me. And in our passage, we're told to hold on to this true faith, by faith, by faith, that we're to look to God for the answers in the midst of this world that wants to give us their thoughts. We're to look to God and say, God, what do you think about all this? We see the heroes in Hebrews 11. It begins with the definition of faith. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. 
faith is holding the hand of God when you really can't feel the hand of God, but you have to hold God's hand in this world or taking the step that looks like there's nothing there, but God says, go, and you realize you're walking on water. That's what faith is. It's trusting in a God who says, go, I'll be with you. I'm right there with you. I love you. And you go and show the world what it's like to live as my child. We hear in our passage about several of the heroes. First of all, we hear about Abel, one of the first children of Adam and Eve. He loved God so much that he proved his faith by bringing the best to God. Because that's what faith is. Bringing the best to God. Are you bringing the best to God? Are you giving God the best thoughts? The best actions, the best things, those are sacrifices, offerings that you give to God to say, God, I trust you. I'm going to live and give you all that I have. Now, we learn of Abel that his brother Cain murders him because of jealousy. But we hear that Abel still speaks to us today of faith, that even though he was murdered, his testimony comes out to us to say, you give God the best. You give God the best. That's what faith is all about. And it involves sacrifice. When we say, look, I can't withhold from God because to do so would be trusting myself. I'll give to God. And as Jesus said, God will take care of you. Allowing that experience, that's what faith is, to say, God, I don't have enough, so I'm giving you anyway. And watching God come through for you because that's what God does. We hear about Noah, who built an ark in the middle of a dry earth. People mocked his obedience to God's voice, but God said it, and Noah kept doing it. He was a preacher of righteousness in the midst of a wicked and perverse world. His act of building the ark, as some have said, could have taken 20 to 60 years to make. Could you imagine that? Day after day after day after day, people mocked him and ridiculed him, but Noah kept building the ark. Because he would rather be obedient than to be praised. When was the last time people said, why do you keep doing this church stuff? There is no God. Come on. Do you hear those things? You keep building that ark. You keep building and doing the things that God commissioned you to do. That's what faith is all about. I admire Noah's conviction, patience, and desire to please God rather than other people. We learn about Enoch. We don't know much about Enoch. It comes from the book of Genesis. All it says is Enoch was, then he was not. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. That's all we know about him. But by faith, he pleased God. By faith, he ripped this world apart and said, nope, I'm going where God is. I'm going to take God in my daily life. And before long, that veil that separated God's presence from the world's presence was torn in two as he entered God's presence. God took him by faith. Do we take God wherever we go? Or or better yet, do we recognize that God is with us wherever we go? Because we really can't take God anywhere, can we? We hear about uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who left all they had to follow the direction of God into new lands. Notice their images, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They lived in tents. That's an image for us to realize. They did not put down roots here on this earth. They traveled lightly because they were looking for the city to come that was ahead of them. We see in the scriptures that all those like Lot who would put down roots in this earth ended up losing it all. This world is not our home. We are pilgrims passing through. Travel light and look for the eternal city to come. Jesus told us, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'm coming again to take you myself, that where I am there you may be. We're on a trip. By faith, move forward. We hear the scriptures again. Look at verses 13 through 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for the country of their own. 
Now, if they'd been thinking about the country they had left, they would have the opportunity to return. But instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, notice what it says, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's you and me. God is not ashamed to say, look, my children, they're not sticking out here. They're, they're coming. They're coming, with, they're coming to me. I'm coming to them. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob saw their work and faith as acts of obedience to God, and they committed their lives to him. And we're told, as Jesus said, do not put your treasures on earth. Do not store them up here. Store them in the world to come. You're pilgrims journeying through. We learn about Sarah. By faith, Sarah experienced the impossible things of God. Though she was in her 90s, God said she would have a child, and she laughed. I believe she laughed with joy. And God said, okay, Sarah, you laughed. Your child's name is laughter. That's what Isaac means in Hebrew. And every day she would see Isaac as a little baby and just smile. You ever smiled at a baby? Of course you have. How could you not? Well, well sometimes, you know, I mean, like, I'll be honest as a father, sometimes. <laughs> but, but you usually laugh because you look at the child and you go, that's, look at the joy. And God wanted her to know, as God wants us to know this morning, that joy is who God is. It's not happiness. Happiness comes and goes. It's fleeting. It's there. It's gone. Joy is permanent. Sarah, I'm calling your child laughter. Now you laugh away on this journey because I'm bringing you joy. By faith, she received the promise of God. By faith, she said, okay, God, I'll receive it. And she did. And there's a great temptation for each one of us to forget that God is the God of miracles, isn't there? Sometimes we are so tempted to look at this world with the eyes of flesh and say, oh, this is all there is, when Jesus kept saying, open your spiritual eyes, open them up. Do you see what God is doing? Do you know that our Father in heaven is the God of the impossible? He's not rational according to the world. God works the way God wants to work. To God, the seas part, and people walk through on dry ground. That's normal. In God's reality, the armies of this world are surrounded by angel armies of fire, as we're told. To God, his son would die on the cross, but he would rise again on the third day. Impossible. But that's God's world, and that's God's realm. And God's ways are strange, but I believe God's reality includes miracles because I have seen miracles happen before my eyes. Have you? That's God's reality. And by faith, we will see more. By faith, Abel gave the best offering to God. By faith, Noah built the ark as others ridiculed him. By faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob stayed in tents because they were journeying to the eternal city. By faith, Sarah received an impossible thing, a child that made her laugh. And they all trust in God. But notice the scripture tells us, but these people, by faith, conquered the world, but they were still waiting for what was yet to come. They died not receiving the promise. What the author is intending to tell us is this. We can be inspired by them because we are on the other side of the cross. Can you imagine that? We know Jesus. God's word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen him. We've touched him. We heard him. We listened to him. We obey him. We see his miracles. We are blessed because Jesus is reality. And if these people in the Old Testament could trust in God, certainly we could be living by faith. Jesus in his ministry time and time again kept asking us, are you living by faith? Are you living by faith? Are you living by reality? When Jesus saw a storm on the water in Matthew 8, he asked us, why don't you trust in God? Oh, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? When Jesus 
in, in Matthew's gospel, the 17th chapter, said, look, if you only had a grain, a kernel, a small mustard seed, you could move mountains. He told us that if we could live by faith, we could say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. At one point in his ministry, at the very end, near the cross, Jesus looked out at his disciples. And imagine Jesus <sighs> looking at them, and he said these words. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? He left us with that question. In a way, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because Jesus would have us live by faith. And I know you and I know myself that when Jesus comes again, or if I go to meet him, I want him to see that I'm living by faith. God, I trusted you. It didn't look right, but I trusted you. I didn't think you could do that, God, but you did it. Jesus, your love. I knew it by faith. And I gave it out by faith. And Jesus, I saw the suffering of the world. And by faith, I worked to alleviate that suffering. I want to show that Jesus, when he returns, there is faith on the earth. And I'm one of those who has it and lives it and does it. Isn't that what you want too? What is faith? Well, it's defined in Hebrews 11, but I want to end the message by saying what John Calvin said, great theologian, reformed thinker. He defines faith in one of the most beautiful ways I've ever heard. He says this in his Institutes, book number three, he says, faith is a certain, a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, found upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ, revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Do you hear what he's saying? Faith is knowing that God is good. God is good to you. God will be good to you. God will be good to this world. If God didn't withhold his only son, why would God withhold anything from us? And those who live by faith live as though God is good and God loves us. And because God loves us and God has alleviated our pain and our suffering, we go to love the world and alleviate the pain and the suffering of the world too. That's what it means to live by faith. I needed these past two weeks, and I want to thank you again for the vacation time because I needed to see the pictures that reflected, that, that made me reflect on my life to say, God, who am I? I know who I am, but what am I here to do? And God showed me picture after picture after picture, and I could hear God's Spirit say, Ross, remember? feel it? Remember when I called you into faith and ministry? Don't forget. Now maybe this morning you need an invigorating of your faith, a reminder of when God came to you, what did God say? What did God do? And are you still living that today? Or have you gotten caught up in the frustrations and anger of the world? Don't. It's time to reflect. I'd like to end the message today by asking you to close your eyes and I want to ask you a few questions and I want you to begin meditating and thinking about how God is with you, how God loves you. The first question is this. When did God first become real to you? Do you remember? Do you remember the moment or moments when you knew that God was with you, that God loved you, God had a plan for your life? What did the word faith mean to you when you first believed? Have you lost that sense of faith? Does your faith need to be reinvigorated this morning? Oh God, you love us so much. 
You keep telling us that we're your children. Remind us what it means to live by faith. Help us to trust in you as we journey from this life to the next. Give us the strength to alleviate the suffering of this world for all people as we receive that peace and healing for our own lives. May we give it out freely. Help us to live by faith. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 9.15 and 11.15. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.